Hi, everyone. Welcome to Chai Side Chats, an exclusive interdisciplinary talk show that features interviews with folks about creativity, the arts, healing, personal growth, spirituality, identity, culture, representation, etc., etc. I'm your host, Aishwarya Subramanian, and I'm excited to introduce my guest for today um, on this episode of Chai Side Chats. So, today's guests have been torchbearers when it comes to the fusion of Indian and contemporary styles of dance in the South Asian diaspora. One of them is an acclaimed New York City based dancer, choreographer, and teacher, and arts administrator who seeks to bring together arts and activism through her work. The other is an artist whose work is at the intersection of choreographed dance, community organizing, and arts education in the Washington DC metro area. Um, personally, I've had the privilege of seeing both of them perform and talk about a variety of topics, and I'm really looking forward to what I, what, what I hope will be a thoughtful conversation on this episode. So please welcome Brinda Goha and Daniel Phoenix Singh. Hi, Hi. Brinda. Hi. Looking welcome forward. to Chai Side Chats. Yeah, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us, yes. Um, so diving right in, I want us to talk about um, authenticity and cultural appropriation in the world of dance. I think that's that's a really big umbrella. And, you know, nowadays there's so many dancers out there who are doing fusion in some way, shape or form. And for me, it really like begs the question of what does fusion even really mean? So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well as, you know, how both of you navigate the trickiness of appropriation as dancers and choreographers yourselves. Daniel, take it away. Sure. Um, I can just speak from my experience. Uh, you know, for me, I was interested in a lot of different things and I wanted to be able to bring them all together. You know, like I grew up in India, I live in the US. I was interested in modern dance. I was interested in um, club or community oriented dance forms and uh, Bharatanatyam. And I wanted to be able to kind of find a way to engage in all of those interests. And so so that's where I felt like I needed to find a way to make it all happen without it seeming superficial, but really thoughtful. And, and so for that, I, for me, my journey into it was to immerse myself in each form for about 10 years. So I could understand it inside out. You know, I did that with Bharatanatyam, with modern dance, with social dance forms. And then I felt like, okay, now I can try to play and see what, what might emerge out of it. And so I think if someone has committed and, and put in the work to develop their voice and their um, knowledge of the form, then you're able to like, you know, once you learn the rules, you can break them, kind of that old, old statement. So that's kind of how I approach it. And, um, and I feel with my company, even though often I have, um, non-South Asian dancers performing Bharatanatyam or, or the hybrid work we do. I actually prefer hybrid over fusion because you know the, the term fusion is kind of violent. You know, it's, it's a chemical nuclear pressure that creates this thing. And I feel a hybrid or syncretic uh, vocabulary feels more peaceful to me. Um, so, we, so I really coach them on the whole of it, not just the movement, but the philosophy, the thought process, um, what was originally done, what people are questioning and challenging now, uh, you know, and I, and, I, and I also have them come and see the artists ranging from the traditionalists like the Ben and Jayans to Malika Sarabhai, who's like the complete opposite and is questioning everything the Ben and Jayans are doing. And I want my dancers to see all that and then form their own opinion and question and challenge me as well, because I feel like I can only speak to it with my vision and my dancers are my really my eyes and ears and my uh, my brain in the studio to help me not walk into a blind spot. And then lastly, I have, uh, you know, I have advisors. I work with Uttara Kurulavala very closely and she often comes and advises our work. I have rehearsal directors and often they will pull a performance right before um, show night. They'll pull it the day before and say, this is not ready or this doesn't feel appropriate for this theater or audience. And I trust them to be that kind of caretaker and advisor for me. So those are some of the ways in which I negotiate my struggles with appropriation and, and de delving into new forms. Wow, Daniel, well said. <laughs> I share a lot of those same concerns. Um, it's very similar for me as well. I love what you said about hybrid. I think hybrid is way more of an energetic 
there's a there's an energetic synchronicity to to the actual process with the word hybrid, um, and I think that that's the first best alternative I've heard to fusion. So thank you for that offering. Um, I will be using that from now on for sure. <laughs> I will credit you. Um, I think you know it's funny. I, I think appropriation is such a problem. You know, I think it's. Uh, a deep, deep problem that is prevalent in dance, but it's kind of prevalent in wellness and um, just our engagement with activities. And especially there's like the spotlight on it right now because we're at home, because we're twiddling our thumbs. You know, I'm not, you're not, but you know, a lot of people are creatively stuck. And so we're kind of putting this spotlight into what is appropriation and or or what is creativity and how much of it is appropriated right and and the way i consider appropriation is it's through the actual literal definition of the word you know it's it's who's reaping the benefits and who's reaping you know who, who who's reaping all the all the what's it called uh, rewards from the hard work on the backs of who and then who's getting exploited for that reason right so when i think of dance it's t- it's tough because we have a rich legacy of contemporary indian dance we have a rich legacy of folks who are breaking those rules right uh, and and i would like to consider myself a contemporary you know student of that legacy of trying to figure out what rules I can break and how much training I need to be able to break those rules in whatever's form. That being said, it's it's really about the dividends. It's really about what is funneling back into the community that gave me that knowledge, you know? And 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 I always am trying to find ways to do that. And in the beginning, it was tough because it was about survival. Like if I'm making $5, do you want me to give you three? Like, I don't know, you know, I don't, it was, it was, it was about, uh, it was about making my work stand out and making my thought process stand out and, and sharing that with folks and making sure that I was taking care of myself in that way. But over time, when you when you build a company and then you take up space and you and and you're part of a lineup and now you're part of a field and now you're part of a community, then that space that you're taking up and it's our responsibility to let people know where we're getting this information from, you know. And so <clears throat> it's important um, to have those people who will hold you accountable, like Daniel was saying. You know, I have people in the field who will really let me know if something is is too too bold, you know, it's too ambitious. And just because I'm fascinated with something doesn't mean it needs to go into my dance, you know? Um, and then other folks who will really push me in in the direction of, of where I feel fear, you know, and, and, and let me know that I have the knowledge and that, that, the, that they believe that I have the knowledge to kind of experiment with this more, push this further, you know? And so in both regards, it's that accountability, number one, that's, that's really important. But then number two, from an organizer's perspective, it's like, what, what resources are going back to these communities, you know, because when I see somebody take a mudra or a section from a piece that I have seen or a whole a whole range of things that exotifies, first of all, our existence, you know, which is already upsetting. But then on top of that, like really capitalizes off of it, then I have to I have to ask for that accountability. And then vice versa is true too. You know, um, and I need to be able to listen when people are asking for accountability or asking, hey, where did you get trained in, in, you know, African dance? Where did you get trained in Latin dance? Like, really, like, where did that come from? And me being able to not be offended when those questions are being asked of me, because I'm asking that of other people, you know? Um, So I think that you know, cultural appropriation is a problem in dance specifically. It's hard because we are inspired by other movements. It's one body, it's one emotionality. So the way that we want to express ourselves might feel like appropriation, but really might just be inspiration. And it's really, really tough. But I think that is the job. The job is to figure out and be able to justify, you know, this is, this is the work 
this is uh, why I feel like I deserve to try this work. And this is why I feel like I deserve to present this work, you know, and, and, and letting the community know um, I'm open. I'm open to if this worked or not for you. But I do think dance and music are, are tricky in this way, you know, uh, considering our creativity is about expansion and expanding might mean infringing upon other people's space and existence. And I think we have to be careful. I do think we have to be careful and we have to, more than careful, we have to, we have to care. <laughs> we have to care about what we're doing and what we're saying. Yeah. I think totally. I just also want to add to that, you know, like even within Bharatanatyam for us um, who practice in that style, there's question of if the form was appropriated from the Devadasis or not, you know, like the, the most of the performers now are from upper class Brahmin um, traditional families uh, and they talk about how they've had it for 200 years. But what about before the 200 years and who had it then and and what happened between those years and whose voices are taken away? And so. You know, it's kind of a complicated question to talk about appropriation in in, in the, in the con context of Indian dance forms within India itself, even before you take it out of India. And then when you add the diaspora and you add the other forms, there are layers to it. I think we'll never be able to get to a place where we can speak to authenticity because what is authentic? You know, like that's such a complicated question. But I think what we can always do is be open to criticism and be honest with ourselves about, about these questions. Um, and there are voices like Nritya in Chennai now who are speaking out for women from the Devadasi tradition who have been silenced. And you know, how, do we, how do we center their voices? How do, we, how, how do I take myself out of the conversation and make space for her voice now? I don't need to be talking anymore. I'm a male, uh, you know, like I don't, I don't need to be in this place. And so part of the question about for me, at least, is you know, about authenticity and appropriation is then then going back like like um, Brenda saying about the giving back the dividends is like going back to the sources and if they're still around, how do we center them and how do we make sure that they have the resources they need to have fulfilled artistic lives? Yeah, thank you, thank you both so much. I think that was such a yeah, I mean, obviously, this is such a large, <laughs> large topic, right? And it's kind of its own, it can be like its own session or own episode. But, um, you know, since both of you talked about just accountability and responsibility, um, I actually came across a quote from uh, Sadhguru from the Isha Yoga Foundation earlier today. And um, he said something like, as humans become more empowered, there's a fundamental need for us to become more conscious and more responsible rather than reactive and compulsive. And I, I feel like that quote is very resonant to what we've been talking about. And, you know, specifically for, you know, the type of work that both of you do, um, you know, in terms of like in, incorporating social justice and social change, right? Because I think that's also about, you know, looking at whose voices are not being heard or whose voices are being silenced, whose voices are louder in whatever it is that we're talking about. Um, I'd love to hear both of you, just your thoughts on, you know, do artists have like a moral obligation or social responsibility to create content that raises awareness of certain things or has power to make change in society in some way? My, my first instinct to that question is to clarify that there is a difference between an activist and you know, an artist that's commentating or working in the realm of so social justice and awareness, right? So there's there's kind of that difference, and and I say that I, I want to be clear about that because what activists do is this frontline work that's really tangible and it's really important work, and it's 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 um, in a lot of ways putting their bodies on the line in order for us to have the space and the freedom to make the commentary that it is that we want to make with art, you know? So I think it's important when, you know, to, to clarify that dancers who comment on social justice are not necessarily activists, unless they, of course, unless they identify as one. Um, I personally am not an activist. I would, uh, you know, 
uh, argue to say, but I am definitely interested in activism and, uh, and I am interested in um, understanding the social implications of the work that I put out. Um, do I think there's a moral obligation to do so? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm very much, I'm very much uh, in that boat where I think it's important to understand that art is political because art is the act of expressing something and that is political. Having free will is political. Having access to information and knowledge is political, right? So the things that I have access to, that I had access to growing up, I grew up learning Kathak from my mother, uh, Guru um, Malubika Guha in, in New Jersey. And it was, you know, there's so many privileges attached to that. First of all, um, I'm a higher caste person. I am born into a comfortable means. Um, my mother is my dance teacher. I didn't have to pay for training for 20 years, you know? Um, I'm learning in my garage, you know, <laughs> like there's, there, there's so much access to the information. And so it's, for me, if I don't acknowledge that, and if I don't put that in the forefront of my social commentary, then my social com commentary does not hold much weight, right? And so I can't go in and try to give people opportunity and things like that without naming the, the ease with which I got to, you know, got to certain points in my life and then other points I had to fight like hell you know and so finding finding those pockets and being transparent about those pockets is step one into our work but to answer the original question it's a moral obligation in my opinion to to make sure that your art presenting and your art making you know is conscious of the world around us I had this discussion with somebody recently and they were just like as an artist, you should be able to create about whatever you want to create about. It shouldn't have to be political all the time, you know? And I said, that statement right there is extremely political for me. You know, the, the fact that you get to pick and choose um, what you will respond to as if you are not already responding to the world around you, you know? And so I think being able to create art is political. But I think as we move forward and as we create space for others and the next generation and marginalized folks and folks who don't have as much access as we do or don't have that privilege, um, I think it's really, really important to uh, be able to say what is political about the work, why is it important and what are we missing? You know, what are we missing and who has access to that knowledge and how do we pay them to get here <laughs> and, and teach us, you know? Um, yes, I think it's extremely pivotal that artists remain um, in touch with the world that's going on around us and somehow, and somehow bring it into their work because the arts are to, are to lift the, our consciousness. So it's a huge responsibility, but we can't do it if we're talking about nothing, you know? And so um, that's kind of where I stand on that. No, that's that's really great, and I think you know a lot of my thoughts align with that as well. Because, you know, I think about the first time I was exposed to political dance, or what you would call "quote unquote" political dance, and it was in a very traditional Bharatanatyam concert. You know, Malika Sarabhai was doing "In Search of the Goddess." Every story she took was from a traditional Indian, uh, you know, scripture or myth, and she talks about the story where Indra rapes a woman, and he's told to just sacrifice a horse, but the woman is, you know, cast aside and punished much more. And that's in our scriptures, right? And so she starts from that story and talks about things that are happening in our story. She talks about Ahalya, you know, she is turned into a stone for someone else's sin. She talked about Tulsi, you know, like she again becomes a plant because her uh, God came in the guise of a husband and raped her. So, so like, I feel like, People think that political is something that's outside the traditional or is outside of what we have to do. But I feel like our work has always been, like 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 um, Brenda said, has always been political. People choose their own personal taste, whatever journey they want to do. That you know, they they pick and choose the stories they want to portray. But you know, I think the work is there in our traditions. It's there. The questioning is always built into the root of the work we do. It's whether we want to bring it up or not really is the choice. And I think 
when I think about it that way, I think I have a privilege of being a dancer and choreographer. I can't squander it. And so I think with all that privilege, like when I was saying comes responsibility. And, and I feel like if, if I can't be out there in the front lines fighting, the least I can do, the least I can do is be political in the work I do. And, and, and again, you know, like I do very little in comparison to what's happening on the ground and what people are doing. But, but even apart from the work that I do, when I go and watch a performance, I can go see one performance that's just abstract or just a light performance, but I probably can't see it over and over again. I can't see the same choreographer's work over and over again in that context. The ones that tend to interest me are the ones who can do that, but can also can really in, um, integrate really complicated questions, not to answer them per se, but just to ask those complicated questions and say, how are you going to process this? And so those are the artists that interest me in, in you know, and I watch and work and I feel like that also is kind of how I, I approach my own work. Not not every dance has to be political, um, but it, like a commitment to social justice is definitely driving through everything we do um, in our company. Yeah. Yeah, thank you both for sharing. I think what both of you talked about is, you know, just this idea that we are embedded in the systems, right? That are in society and we are interacting with them. Sometimes we're part of the oppressive systems too. And it's like, of course, the stuff that we create as artists is gonna have some connection to that, right? Whether it is more obvious or not, depending on how you present it. But um, yeah, I mean, especially, you know, Daniel, when you were talking about just, you know, themes from Hindu mythology that other folks have, you know, presented as artists and there's connections there to like patriarchy and all these other, um, I guess forces of conditioning that are in our society and have been unfortunately for many many years. So, um, and the powerful women who questioned it also are in our mythologies, you know. So mm -hmm. both of both of them are working there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, and so you know, since we were talking about just you know creating art in response to, but also taking you know, content from what's happening in our world. I'm curious, like for both of you, has there been a particular piece or project or production that you have like directly taken from something that's happened? It could be like an event or a particular circumstance. And I'm curious if that changed you, like the process of creating art around that changed your experience of it, changed feelings for it, like for yourself, just thinking about you as a person. So I can I can talk about a few different examples. Um, I think for me, you know, I did a piece around the concept of Tulsi, and and my exposure to it from was from a Bollywood movie. There's a, a, a man who has two wives, and the second wife uh, talks about how she's like the Tulsi plant. You know, she can never come into the house. She has to be always in the courtyard because she's not the first wife. Um, and and so so then I was like you were you know the song was really haunting and melodic with Lata Mangeshkar singing it. Then I was like, well, I need to like do a little more research on this. And I started reading about the myth of Tulsi, and I re read about how you know like Vishnu goes in the guise of her husband and, and and rapes her, but then she's the one who becomes a plant, you know, as as a response to that because she was disloyal to her husband. Um, so like that became you know that that was the source of my inspiration to create that piece, but really it started with the Bollywood song that had nothing connected to that, right? So you can start anywhere, and then you you progress along it in in the way that your interests attach to it. Um, but the tulsi is also the most revered plant, you know, like that's the plant all the women play pray to to safeguard their marriages. So it's this like this irony of contradictions there and and i think that's some of the richness of our of our mythology nothing is simple it talks about it in the complexity of our lives so that was one one way i got inspired and worked on it um, i go and watch other performances as much as i can uh, not just in dance i go to poetry readings uh, literature festivals photography and so one of those outings i came across a reading of um uh, a reading of queer men's poetry they're all been men uh, who we've lost to AIDS and uh, there was a reading around their work and you know I, I've struggled with that in multiple ways because as a dancer you know I'm, I'm almost 50 if I look to the next generation above me there's a big gap between dancers male dancers who are gay between 55 to about 70 
the AIDS years, they're gone. You know, there's like, there's just no one there. And, and so like, I felt that ache because anytime I want to like get a reference, I don't have anyone in that generation. They've all passed away from AIDS. And so I decided to use their poetry and create an evening length work around that. And, and that definitely changed me because even though I was a buddy and I volunteered with Whitman Walker Clinic and worked with um, HIV positive people whose families had abandoned them um, and they were dying alone in hospital beds, you know, like that's, that was just, that wasn't that far ago. That, that was just like 15 years ago. So um, I did that and I thought, you know, it's been 15 years. I won't, I won't, it won't be difficult to do this work, but it was so complicated to like read these poetries and, and to kind of dredge up those feelings again. Um, you can't not be affected by work that's so personal and deep, but, but, but also like inspires you. These men were dying and they were creating, you know, like they knew they were dying. They were creating, they were writing their stories. They were celebrating their lovers. They were celebrating the life they had even on their deathbed. And, and, and that was the inspiration for me to get to the difficult painful parts of it because they found a way to heal in their journey. And my job was finding ways to amplify that voice now, you know, in my generation, they're not physically here, but I can take their voice. I can take their art and bring it out to life. Um, so that's, that's another, another inspiration as an example. So like my inspirations are all over the place. Um, and, and I think people often come to me and say, Oh, wow, really, you know, like you've been using poetry and film and all this, and it should feel like, you're breaking ground. And I was like, really? But for me, Bharatanatyam did that already. You know, like, you know, uh, there's a story in mythology in, in Bharatanatyam teaching where they say, when you go to learn the dance teacher, the dance teacher says, well, do you know music? If you don't know music, I can't teach you. And you go to the music teacher, music teacher says, well, do you know percussion? If you don't know percussion and the meters, I can't teach you the music. And the percussion um, person says, well, have you learned sculptures? All the rhythms are captured in their sculptures. Like if you don't know sculptures. I... So the, what they're really pointing is that there's no one thing that you can pull apart. The composite nature of arts are really inherent in South Asian forms and Asian forms possibly in all forms, but so, so I don't feel like I've really gone out and done something groundbreaking. I feel like we're only rediscovering that voices and elements that have always been around us in different ways. And so I think that's also something that's humbling to me is like to think that forms and traditions that have been around for 2000 years in different forms, maybe not in the way it's presented and performed now, that person went through the same kind of feelings and questions and journeys like I did. That's that's like that's powerful to me to feel that I can be on that moment where I can have the same vibration and connection with that person. So that's that's what I find exciting and inspiring. For pieces, you know, that have changed kind of changed me as I was creating it. Um, one that comes to mind is I did a piece with my mother. Uh, conceptualized it with my mother called Nadi, uh, Women of the World. And so it was just kind of a, a quick zoom into uh, Kunti and then Dropodi and then Gandhari. And I, I was trying to kind of find some, you know, strong woman vibes in, in that, right? And so what, you know, my transformation story was my approach. My approach went in and it took the really clear uh, surface level kind of narrative of what was going on and I was going to place it in three different parts of the stage and for Gandhi I was going to work with with blindfold and a table and a lot of acrobatics and then you know for Dropodi it was going to be more of the courtroom scene so a lot more of the like the, the gambling scene and the courtroom scene and then into a Gaza a gazal for her ending and then you know I was I was composing it right I was like creating the puzzle of it and then only when it came to actually diving in, you know, really diving into each of the scenes, explaining the work, what, I, what ended up happening for me was that I had to explain to my company members who have zero knowledge of, of these mythological, the, the, the layers of these women, right? Um, as I was explaining it to them, as I was literally talking in the words were coming out of my mouth my choreography was changing like it, it was just like changing I had to throw out everything I had to start all the way over and I had to actually find the essence of what it is that I was going to say right and so um 
I remember during the Dropodi scene, I actually ended up playing Dropodi for that, for that, for our first presentation of that. And you know, I'm a Kathak dancer, so for me, it was a full gazal, it was a full abhinaya piece, and I was, I was very much into the understanding of of what that moment of embarrassment or vulnerability could have been like for her. And um, as it was happening, and as I was doing it, and as I was realizing the the score that I chose, which was my mom, who's my guru, her guru, actual voice, Bela Guru Bela Arnob, was an actual singer, was, was a gazal singer, and it was her voice. And what we did was we stripped away all the the music from the track, so we just kept it a cappella, and we just kept it her voice. And as I was doing that, I can't even tell you, it felt like my ancestors were pushing me to the front of the stage. Like I just, it, it really felt like, I knew it was gonna feel deep because <laughs> I chose something layered and deep, but I did not know what it was gonna feel like to put myself in that position where my guru's guru, a cappella voice about if I ripped off my skin and you only saw my bones, would you still think I'm beautiful? You know, like, I didn't realize that that guzzle was going to change my life, you know? Um, and so the, the, it was always these very personal pieces that kind of transformed then, right? So then you work backwards. I'm crafting the guzzle for myself because I have to perform and I'm, tra- I'm working on it, right? And as I'm crafting that, you work backwards and then you realize like, what was the gambling match really about? Was it about ego? Was it about what was what was this match about? Mind you, I had women playing these five brothers, you know. So 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 then, how do I encapsulate this masculine, toxic masculinity in these feminine beings, um, which was in itself a political choice to have women play all the roles, right? Um, but how do I get them to understand the difference between Beam and his brothers, and like? How do I get him? How do I get them to understand what lurch this left Dropodi in? <laughs> you know what I mean? This layered, layered longing for uh, you know someone to save her, and and and, and how uh, deeply personal that is, and how deeply uh, uh, transformative that is, right? And then from there to go and then switch into the world of Gandhari and her husband having a conversation at a table blind, you know, blindfolded and, and having to trust each other's bodies to be able to tell the story about how they could raise a son such as their son, you know? And so really going into this generational aspect of something that was supposed to be a composite piece. It was supposed to be a puzzle, a snapshot, you know, as I was creating the piece and as I was creating the ensemble for each of the sections, I was completely transformed by the depth and the breadth of these characters, you know? Um, So in and of itself, I had to go back, start over, go back, start over, go back, start over, because even though I knew what I wanted to do, I had no idea what I wanted to do until I knew. and, and, and I will consider that piece always a work in progress because I think there's so much more to these characters than I was able to touch upon that, that it feels unfinished. Wonderful. Yeah, I could hear both of you guys talk all day. It's amazing to hear about your process, but um, I wanna transition now into our experiential activity. Um, I wanted us to play a little, I'm gonna call it an activity slash game called um, Pass the Movement. And I'm hoping this will be just like a fun way for us to kind of play around with movement as much as we can in Zoom boxes, but um, also for our viewers to kind of get a sense of your processes and your, um, yeah, the way that you guys work with movement. So um, basically, one of us can begin. I can start. I'll start with the movement and then I'll pass it on to someone else. Um, The other person can mirror or copy the movement. and um add a little bit of their own flair to kind of make it your own and then you'll pass it on to the third person and we'll just kind of keep going i'll set a timer for a couple of minutes and we'll just see what happens and how far we get how does that sound Mm -hmm. yeah make sense okay great let's start
All right. How was that? Did you guys have fun? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, that was lovely. That was lovely. Yeah. I like I like that we I like that we didn't have a rule like if it was the last movement or if it was the first movement that we picked up. I enjoyed I enjoyed the surprise of that and that it wasn't consistent each time. That was cool. Yeah. No, it was fun. It was fun. I I you know, like I like playing without knowing the rules so then we kind of can make it whatever we want it to be so it was fun yeah yeah awesome yeah i think my intention was to do like a little more improv because i think uh and also just like bring a little bit more fun to the making art i think that's also yeah. one of my intentions with this show and with the experiential activities is to like bring a little bit of fun maybe some silliness because we're we can be very serious sometimes it's like we need to break out of that once in a while so um, yeah, thank you both so much for, you know, being on this episode. I've really appreciated the amazing conversations and topics that we've touched on. It's obviously just a little bit, just like a step in the ocean, but you know, it's, it's so wonderful to hear both of you speak about your work. So thank you so much for being here. Hi everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Chai Side Chats with Brenda and Daniel. Please do like, share, and subscribe to the Creativity Awakening YouTube channel for regular updates on our videos. Episodes for Chai Side Chats premiere every two weeks, so stay tuned for our next one coming soon.